All right, we are recording. Well, welcome you guys to our ongoing coaching meeting here on January the 13th of 2021. Happy New Year to everybody. I wasn't uh, with you guys last week, but I got to rewatch the session and didn't Brent do an unbelievable job? I thought it was extremely helpful. Getting some applause, Brent, some virtual applause there. As he talked about strategic planning, uh, Jim and Brent both mentioned to me, I, I was out last week and my daughters were still out of school. So we were on a little, a little trip. They're back in school now. But they both mentioned to me how important they thought it would be for the group to talk some about uh, strategic planning. And so Brent did a great job with that. And I wanted to continue that discussion today and talk a little bit more about it. I don't have a ton to say, but I want to show you a couple things and then we can, um, Jim, if Jim has anything to add, I don't know that he got to share as much last week, he can add uh, to this and then we can take some questions. But um, when they started talking about strategic planning, it just reminded me of some things that Stan had shared with us early on. And so I want to go through some of those with you guys. So by a show of hands, and I can't see everybody because we're on multiple screens now, but by a show of hands, how many of you guys made it through all 12 of our training lessons and not just the first eight? How many have gone through all 12? Okay, not everybody, but a lot of people. Okay, so our lesson, and really there's 13, right? We added, uh, we, we expanded lesson 12 into two lessons, but our lesson 13 stands lesson 12. Uh, he actually called it strategic planning. And I was on the phone with him today for a little bit and I was talking to him a little bit more about it. And so I wanna tell you some of the things he told me that I thought were super helpful. And then I wanna go through part of this, our lesson 13, his lesson 12 with you guys today that like Brent's will help give you some questions to ask about some of these elements as you guys at the beginning of this year are uh, thinking about planning to raise the sales in your context. So here's how Stan said this lesson came to be, which I thought was helpful. He said they would get to the end of a training let's say it was 12 weeks or they did this 12 weeks over a week long, you know, every day or, you know, a, a two day training or something. And people would want to know, you know, what to do next. And so, like I've told you guys before, they use those seven elements to help people know uh, what to do next. And so he said at the end of the training, they would always um, go through this strategic planning lesson so that people could plan what to do next. He said, here was the problem before they added this to the end of the training. He said people would hear one or two things from the training. They would start doing those one or two things, but not everything else. They kind of forget everything else. And you guys are familiar with this, how sometimes people hear about DMM and what they kind of really, uh, what registers uh, with them is DBS, right? So they implement DBS and they're like, we're doing DMM. <laughs> you know, we, we're doing DMM and they got a part of it. They got a tool in DMM, but it's not all encompassing, right? It's just one, you know, DBS is a part of one of the elements, namely focusing on God's word. So what Stan told me earlier is that um, using this strategic planning on a regular basis keeps you from focusing on just one or two elements. I thought that was helpful. It helps you think in terms of how am I going to do all of these? Because he said the natural tendency of some people as they finish the training was they would just cast vision and train believers. Or they would just go out among the lost and try to start groups, but they weren't casting vision to believers, right? Or they were really focusing on God's word, but they weren't really focusing on multiplying extraordinary prayer. And so he thought that this kind of last lesson invited them to think about raising all seven of the sales. Does that make sense, you guys? how somebody could go through the training and take away a couple of things, but leave out a lot of, you know, really important things. So that's kind of how this um, came to be. Now, one thing that's a little bit different about many of uh, our contexts than the context where this training was used, this training that we've been using with you guys and, you know, over, we've used with others, several thousand people now, was primarily used with like catalytic teams or missionary teams. So, when they got to this lesson, lesson 12 or lesson 13 for us, they would go through it as a team. What Stan again affirmed today, and it's kind of what we've thought, and we, we told you guys this, if you remember at the end of lesson 12, is team formation precedes planning. Team formation precedes planning. And he said, and Stan said, because you always want to plan with a team if you can, not just by yourself. In fact, he told me about one guy, uh, I think I can say his name, his name is Sergey from, uh, uh, somewhere overseas where he's a movement practitioner. And he said, he only, he says this, I will only train teams because individuals don't survive. I thought that was an interesting quote. I will only train teams. Now he's learned because individuals don't survive. What I felt like we've done you guys, which I think is good is we have trained a lot of individuals <laughs> that are interested in DMM. And then at the end of the training, what have we told them to do? What's the next step? 
well, you need to go and find a team because you really want to be doing this as a team. So that's what many of you guys have been on the journey of doing is you finish the training, the eight lessons or the 12 lessons, you go and you train other people. Some will want to join you, some won't. You form a team and then you kind of come back to, all right, how are we going to plan and raise the sales together? So you'll see this on the sheet again here in a minute. But I would say, you know, we're all at different points in, in the process here. I would say if you're just getting started or if you're kind of the only one in your area that's caught the vision, I would say your main focus right now should be on team formation, casting vision to other believers, training other believers to form a team or, a, you know, your first Gen Zero DMM church that can do this planning process with you. Because you may find it's also the case that it's better to, you know, take this journey with other people, even like Jesus said, go out two by two, to go with a team rather than by yourself. And this movement practitioner said he's just found that, you know, individuals often struggle. So finish the training, cast vision to others, train others, form a team. And then I just wanted to preface what I'm fixing to show you by saying, you know, go through this planning process once you've gotten to that team through that team formation phase. That's not to say you guys that if you're still just an individual or you're still in the process of casting vision or training others, that this wouldn't be helpful to you just as you implement this yourself. Definitely implement this yourself. Focus on God's word yourself, multiple extraordinary prayer yourself. I would just say what you're aiming toward early on is form a team, get a team. Just like if we were, you know, if we had decided, hey, we're gonna go um, reach Thailand for Christ, you know, you guys would probably encourage me to not go alone it's not, not that you can't go alone, but let's get a team together to go. Let's train a team and let's go as a team. It's just more likely to thrive. So we finish the training, we form teams, and then we start strategic planning. So at the end of Stan's training with missionary teams here, imagine the missionary team there, and they're going to begin to ask these questions about implementing these elements. Make sense so far? So I want to take you through more slowly through part of our lesson 13 here. So let me share my screen. Maybe. Okay. And you guys tell me if you can see this okay. Yep. Thumbs up, Brent. Thank you. Do y'all see focus on God's word right here? Do y'all see that here, Brent? Yeah. Okay. So this is lesson 13. And this is in the folder where all of our lessons are. So you're welcome to grab it there as well. And this, again, is just supplementing. Brent has already covered uh, some of this. This is supplementing what um, he said, and you guys can take what Brent has said and some of Stan's material, put it together, and come up with what's best for your context. But if and when you get to lesson 13 with a team, this is what Stan has led teams through. I'm going to skip some of this part here at the top and just go straight down to the planning, and you guys can pick up uh, you know, the first part later if you like. So we review, just like we do in each of the lessons in the training, the seven elements. And then I thought some of the questions that Stan has used and Erica, his sister-in-law and Dave and some other guys that have used this training in the past are really helpful. So here are some of the questions they use. So you just finished a training. Imagine you've already done team formation. You've got a team. You're ready to go. You have a vision to reach an area. Now you got a plan. What do you do? Well, just like Brent taught you last week, one thing Stan has done with people he's trained and we've done in our context as well is we focus on the seven elements. We want to raise those seven sales. And so we want to begin to ask ourselves some questions. So here are two of the questions that uh, Stan will ask uh, folks under focus on God's word. So you, to make sure after you finish the training, you don't just focus on one of the other elements. Here's how you make sure you focus on God's word. Number one, how will you and your team, because you're doing this with a team, how will you and your team ensure that the beliefs and practices of your DMM church or your DMM team, uh, your Gen Zero DMM church are biblically consistent and necessary? I think that's a good question to wrestle to the ground. How are you going to make sure that the beliefs and the practices of your church are biblically consistent and necessary? One of the things that our DMM church, uh, Gen Zero Church did, one of them, and I encourage many churches to do this now, is for our, our first six months of meeting when we formed our church, we went through basically every passage in the New Testament on the church. What is the church? And tried to hold a lot of our traditions with a loose grip, <laughs> The scripture is our authority. Lord, what are you wanting to say to us about what we should do when we get together? So we spent about the first six months doing, went through a number of passages in Acts and 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, the spiritual gifts passages in 1 Timothy 3. You know, we went through a lot of the church passages. That was one of the things we did that helped us make sure that the beliefs and practices of our new DMM church were going to be biblically consistent and necessary. We weren't doing things we didn't need to be doing that would distract us from the things that we uh, should be doing. 
Number two, what are some activities or principles you need to stop doing or never start doing? I think this will be a really good question for all of us to ask early on. Uh, DMM Gen Zero Church that you start to encourage them to ask this as they begin to meet because they'll be setting the DNA for the Gen 1, 2, and 3 churches and so on. What are some activities or principles you may need to stop doing or never start doing? So it could be some traditions that you're just going, hey, these are not as helpful anymore. It could be things that are hard to replicate. So one thing here for us is we have really always emphasized, hey, these seven questions in the DBS process, they're not sacred, but if we're always changing them, it's going to be hard to replicate. So we would almost, you know, pound our fists on the table and say, we use the same seven questions. <laughs> Not because they're the best, I mean, you could do it different. You could do six questions or eight questions. But the point is, whatever you guys decide to use, you stick with it and everybody uses it. Why? So that it's easy to multiply. So what are some things that you may need to not start doing, like letting everybody decide what they're going to do or decide their own questions or things you may need to stop doing um, that'll help you focus on God's word? Let's keep going. Just want to do an overview here. So multiply extraordinary prayer. Again, member stands leading people through this, helping them focus on all seven of the elements, not just one or two. How will you and your group grow your prayer life in terms of depth and time and sacrifice? What are some goals you want to set from the beginning? Who do you want to, who do you want to be included in these prayer times? I was on a prayer call the other day with uh, some of our DMM churches here in Lubbock, and we were talking about some of the goals we've set for this year. So as you guys are beginning to do some strategic planning, figuring out how you're going to raise the sales at the beginning of this year, I would encourage you to set some goals. We often call them prayer goals because some of the goals we set like a million in 10 years, we can't really control whether it happens. <laughs> it's just something we're praying for. So I would definitely encourage you to be praying some big prayers in 2021. And we find you guys that in our prayer meetings, that's some of our, that's some of the, um, that's one of the best places I think to set goals in the context of prayer. Lord, what do you, what do you want our goals to be this year? What do you want us praying about this year and really helping your DMM churches dream big in terms of raising these seven cells? Um, how can you pray more and mobilize others to pray as well? Sometimes we can forget that on multiplying extraordinary prayer. Uh, we can increase our prayer lives and pray more in a more extraordinary way, but we're not multiplying it, inviting other people to join us. That's really important. So again, these are just not telling you exactly what to do, just good questions to ask to help you raise these seven sales. Casting vision to believers. Who can you cast vision to? So imagine being at the end of a training and asking people this. Hey, you've got contacts that are believers. Who, who, you know, who do you think the Lord wants you to cast vision to? Make a list of people and groups, organizations of people that might catch this vision. How are you going to cast vision to them? Make some concrete plans of how you can do this. I think this will be helpful to you here as you start the new year. So we're casting vision, and then what are we going to do if they catch the vision? Well, we want to we want to train them. And it says here to use the lessons you've completed to train those believers who respond and model it for them. Your best impact will be to multiply trainees and trainers so that many of you are going out instead of just you personally. We're not we're not the only ones training. We're not saying you got to be trained by a pastor or one of us. The kind of you know leaders that start this. We're wanting everybody. You, you guys remember in lesson two or three we talk about hey. Folks that are most effective, most effective movement catalysts, they take this training, they immediately begin to train others. So it's, it's asking them here at the end of the training, as, as they plan, who can you train with these same 12 lessons as soon as possible? You cast vision to folks, the ones that catch it, you know, who's willing to be trained? How will you help those that you train to train others? That's thinking in terms of multiplication, not just adding people to your trainings, but getting more people to train. So we want to make sure we don't just get excited and start going out among the lost and forget that if we get more believers going out among the lost, we're going to reach more people. So we've got to cast vision and we need to train believers this year. How will you cast vision to uh, these believers to train others? It's asking that question here as well. Go out among the lost, the next sale. Who will you invite to start a discovery group with his or her oikos this year? When are you going to invite them? Imagine being in a, in, a, in a DMM Gen Zero church. Let's say there's 12 adults in the room or 16 adults. This could be very a very helpful conversation to have in one of your first church meetings of the year or group meetings or one of your first prayer meetings. Hey, who do you guys know? There are some people that may be interested in doing a discovery group. When are you going to ask them? And just really building in some accountability. How will you find other possible persons of peace? Like, how are you going to go out among the lost? Where are you going to go? And again, 
you, many of you guys are catalysts. So you're not necessarily determining the answers to all of these questions for all of your hopefully long-term thousands of churches. <laughs> you know, you'll be helping to lead them through this process. Now you may have some suggestions based on what's been effective in your area, but again, you're the question asker, right? You're not telling your churches what to do. You're asking them, how do you think you're going to find persons of peace? Where do you think you can find Pipsy people? Let them answer the question. Brent did a great job too of just sharing questions. He wasn't telling them exactly what to do, letting them discover for themselves what, you know, what to do. And number three, how will you and your team change? Well, I like this. Listen to this question. How will you and your team change or adapt your life, your activities, perhaps even your job to gain as much access as possible to potential persons of peace? What? So it sounds like they're even inviting people to make major life changes in order to position themselves to more likely find persons of peace. Are we willing? Are you willing in your area to do whatever it's going to take? to see a movement catalyzed? Well, then some people may take a different job somewhere else, or some people may move into, you know, doing this or doing that or spend more time in this place or that place because it positions them to find more of these persons of peace. I just, I hadn't looked at this in a while until I was going to share it with you guys. And I was like, wow, I mean, they're asking, you know, potentially for a big commitment here, perhaps, perhaps to, you know, um, you know, change your job. It reminded me too of, um, I told you about Billy, a guy my dad invested in in the jail here. And as he wrote out his envision in lesson four, he talked about how the way they were going to reach the jail, he was one of the inmates in the jail. He said the way they were going to reach the jail is through, you know, doing this, finding people of peace, starting groups, which would reach the pod he's in. But he said the way they're going to reach all the other pods is through requesting, he called them requesting remote housing changes, meaning they would request to be moved to another pod to take this into other pods so that it could spread. So they were willing to even, and Billy, that if I'm, if I'm right, I think Billy was in a good pod. There was, you know, there were good pods and not as good pods. <laughs> and, uh, and I think he was in a good pod that a lot of guys want to get into. And so I think we were all impressed when he acted like he would be open and other guys would be open to moving into less desirable pods where you really don't want to live just for the sake of reaching people in that pod. So I think it's a good question. Look at this note. It is crucial that we gain access to more potential persons of peace. So remind your teams of that. It's crucial. We, we've got to gain access to more of these people. These persons of peace are the key to community, reaching communities. The because best way to do, do that. It, I don't know if you haven't moved it up or if I'm just, it's my computer. Oh, do y'all see this? Anybody else see number three here? We're stuck I on time believers, it. Chris. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, it stopped. You know what? did this recently and I had to stop and restart this. Let's try again. Y'all been so patient. Y'all been so patient. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, we haven't heard you for the last 15 minutes, but you know, wait, you're doing great. Okay, hang on a second. Let me see if I can get it back on. I might just paste these in the chat. It might be easier. And you guys actually have here, y'all, y'all, y'all can get open this link. Let me paste the link instead of the questions. Here you go. And then y'all can read along with me. Uh, let me paste in the chat here. There you go. Tell me if y'all can access that link. Everybody click on that link and pull up the document. Might be easier than sharing anyways. Yeah, I see y'all all jumping on. So it should be able to be accessed. So y'all scroll down. <laughs> I think y'all got the got the gist under train believers. We're under uh, go out among the lost now. Do y'all see it if you scroll down? on the note under go out among the lost. Y'all, any thumbs up? Anybody see it? Y'all there? Okay, cool. Note it says, it is crucial that we gain access to more potential persons of peace. The best way to do this is to meet needs, which we learned in the training. That's the key to finding these people in whom God is working is to, um, you know, serve people through, you know, signs and wonders, practical needs, that kind of thing. We meet needs. He says here, we do this both in miraculous ways by healing the sick, casting out demons, et cetera, and by serving our neighbors and meeting needs in the community. So access ministry essentially is how we're looking for and identifying these persons of peace. So then in C group starts. So we go out among the lost. What's the point of going out among the lost? Well, we're trying to find these God prepared people. And then what are we doing with them? We're encouraging them to bring their oikos together to start a group and begin to discover for themselves from God's word, his wonderful plan for their life. Under C group start, do you know, you know, um, I can imagine at the end of a training, you know, group, a team of people asking these questions, like, do you know how you will invite people to start a new discovery group? What's the DG invite question you're going to use? 
How will you make it a priority to focus on groups and not individuals? You guys, this is a great question to ask in our context as you're planning. How are you going to, with your Gen Zero churches and the folks that you're influencing as you're planning, how are you going to make it a priority this year as you go out among the lost to see groups start to focus on groups, seeing groups started? not just discipling individuals? And are you ready with a basic sequence of discovery stories that you'll use in your context? It could be the creation of Christ sequence, could be 10 stories of hope. We have a number of them. Sounds like it says here, you might uh, use different stories, different contexts, just have one to two sets ready. And then last, ongoing coaching. Who are you gonna meet with who is also implementing these DMM lessons? So your answer to that, all of our answer is we've got a meeting each week, we know we're going to. So we know we're trying to raise this sale. Who are you gonna meet with? who's also implementing these lessons. How often are you going to meet? Where are y'all going to meet? What, when are, you know, what's going to be your agenda? And who can help to coach you as you progress? You guys, I think if you combine what Brent sh shared last week and, and you use this as a supplement, I think you've got some really great questions to lead your uh, teams through in thinking about some you know, planning for this year and goal setting. And just a reminder again, for a lot of us, if we've approached this as individuals, we're training individuals, I would encourage you to do a couple of things. Number one, try to start training teams. One thing we've done online, you guys, and if y'all have sent people to us, you may have seen this. One of the prerequisites now for coming through a training with us is that you bring two or three people with you. We've just said, please, that's we just we want to train groups. We want to train potential teams. Maybe you guys could consider doing uh, something similar, you know, training, um, uh, training people together. And just then, if, but if not, if they come individually, then immediately say, hey, before you even begin the planning process, get a team that you can plan with. You don't want to do this alone. You're less likely to succeed. Grab other people to come. So that's why here were our next steps, usually in lesson 13, training individuals, we would say, hey, get an ongoing coaching this week. Come to one of our coaching meetings. Begin to talk to your coach or your team about potential people you can cast vision to. Cast vision to them, train them, and then take them, you know, take them through the training and then form a team. And then you're able to come back here, you guys, and for an area, begin to really think about what does a plan look like to raise all of the seven sales in this area. One of the last, last point, and then Jim, I'd love you to chime in if you want to add anything from last week or this week, and we can do some questions. One thing our DMM church does, so instead of just doing this yearly, and Stan mentioned this earlier when I talked to him as well, I feel like we're doing this regularly throughout the year. And I think Brent, you mentioned something about you do it and you reevaluate in a couple of months. Didn't you say that something like that? So this is not a yearly thing. I think it's more every few months you're looking at your plan. But um, what we would do as a DMM church is we would, um, to keep this in front of us, our meetings every week, and I think I've told you guys some about this, but our meetings every week consist of the seven elements. So every week we're doing some planning around the elements. Now, this Tuesday or last night, our church would have met to do some goal setting, more big picture around these elements and what, you know, how many groups do we want to see started this year? And how are we going to go out among the lost? For sure. But I would say, you guys, one thing that's very helpful at keeping this in front of your team is just whether it's your coaching meeting or your DMM church meeting or whatever, revolve the meeting around the elements. So if you were to come to our typical three hour DMM church meeting on Sunday morning, we're going to focus on God's word using DBS to do it. We're talking about multiplying extraordinary prayer. We may not pray for an hour right then, but we're saying, hey, can everybody do Tuesday night? Good, great. We're praying on Tuesday. And hey, why don't you, you know, here's a way we're going to multiply it. Hey, who's cast vision to somebody this week and how did it go? We'll tell stories. Hey, is anybody, when's our upcoming training? Has everybody invited some people to the training? We need to be training people as a church. Is everybody, we're having that conversation about each of the elements every week. And again, I think I've told you this, but the way we keep it in front of people is um, at least one couple in the church owns at least one of the elements, meaning they're responsible to bring it up and ask us about it. So for, for the, you know, for us, for me and my wife, we were always ongoing coaching <laughs> and we would, as a part of the meeting, talk about coaching. What do we learn in coaching? What have we learned from books or podcasts or people that we've been around? And then somebody else would say, Hey, let's talk about prayer. So you guys, I hope this is helpful. You've got the link um, to use uh, with your teams, but I think strategic planning is super important. Goal setting is super important. Doing it in the context of prayer, I think will really give you some great insight. And I think this will give you some direction in the new year. Jim, brother, anything to add? Yeah, this is this is great. And, and um, I think a lot of people I've talked to are uh, in the process of, hey, how do, I, how do I build this team of people to want to do this together? And I'd say my, my one thing I've learned is I think my original vision of 
of uh, or definition of casting vision was get people to hear about the training and come to the training. And, um, and I think it's supposed to be much more expanded than that. Everything is vision casting. And so just meaning when you go out among the lost, bring people with you, even if they've not gone through the training or they've whatever, that's vision casting. When you're doing extraordinary prayer, you know, invite people to, who aren't even a part of it to join you in that. If you're uh, meeting with a person of peace, you know, uh, every, every time you do that, that's an opportunity to bring someone and go, isn't this cool what's going on here? Man, would you want to be a part of something like that? So we'll just say, uh, think of all the ways that you can get people excited to go, hey, do you want to be a part of this team? Um, to, that, that's a big step in build it, building a team together. That's all I have. Brent, anything to add, brother, from last week or to you, what you want to say in addition? The only to thing that I just add is, is if you're putting together your strategic plan and you recognize that you're training people to go out among the lost or you're training people to pray, um, but you aren't going out among the lost and you aren't praying, uh, I can guarantee you that that lack of authenticity will shoot you in the foot. Um, we can't ask people to do something that we aren't living out in our own lives. And I just say that in love because I've talked to a lot of people who are doing, feel called to this. But when I say, who did you have, who did you have a spiritual conversation with in the last two weeks? And the answer is nobody. And they're leading a training. I think we have to be super honest with ourselves and say, God, would you change my heart? 